Great. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to Statistically Speaking. Uh, this week, we are talking about a subject that makes me distinctly uncomfortable, and that is ANOVA, the Analysis of Variance. So we're going to try to walk through one of the most basic applications of the ANOVA algorithm uh, and, and why it's valuable to you. Hello. Welcome. Come on in. Okay, so along the way, uh, we're going to talk about uh, two people who are really quite famous in, in the space of statistics. And we're going to start with uh, Ronald Fisher, R.A. Fisher. Uh, and we'll also talk a little bit about Tukey, uh, John W. Tukey. So we'll start with a discussion of those because I personally enjoy that history part of, uh, of this subject quite a lot, and I think you will too. From there, uh, we, can, we can start addressing ANOVA, the one-factor, one-way ANOVA, uh, which is an attempt to decide whether these things of different categories, whether they're all the same or not. Uh, so that's the ANOVA algorithm, or the, the ANOVA uh, statistic, the analysis of variance. And then, as a follow-up to ANOVA, I want to introduce you to the Tukey Honestly Significant Difference Test, HSD. So this brings together these two <coughs> huge figures from the history of statistics. Now we start with Ronald A. Fisher. Now, you can't say much of anything about, stati about biostatistics without touching something that R.A. Fisher uh, made a really big impact in. So I, I, I've already sort of talked about several things that, that he worked on without mentioning them by name, but he's going to show up again next week when we talk uh, about contingency tables and things. So uh, R.A. Fisher is a towering statistician. He's someone who shows up everywhere. He's credited with, ha with, with having created the fields of experimental design, which is a fairly big deal. Uh, and along with Haldane and, and Wright, he's very important behind uh, the understanding population genetics. Now, uh, as you can see in this uh, photo of him as a young man, 1912, uh, he was chronically short-sighted, had glasses at a very early age, and that prevented him from being involved in World War I in a military capacity, which meant he survived. Uh, and that's awfully good for our understanding something more about statistics that we would not have without him. Uh, however, it's also worth noting that he was quite well known for having feuds with other statisticians whom he felt weren't as serious or had ideas that were different than his and therefore wrong. So uh, I, I've mentioned before that uh, people like uh, Gossett were very important as, as people to regulate the, committee, the, the community of, of British statisticians. And probably the, the finest example of somebody who could use some cooling off was R.A. Fisher. So that's very worth knowing. You can find any number of biographies out there about R.A. Fisher. Most of them touch just some aspect of his career because he was so prolific across so many different areas. So very worth knowing this name, R.A. Fisher. So uh, I want to point out that we've already had some discussion of eugenics. It just seems that eugenics was where everyone thought they needed to be working uh, as statistics was developing as a field. Now, this is particularly true when we get to R.A. Fisher. Now, I'm, I'm reading a, a paragraph from this study. This is not a journal I cite very often. That's kind of a long name, isn't it? Studies in the history, of in the history and philosophy of biology and biomedical science is the name of the journal. Uh, and this, this Moore article from 2007 included this summation of, uh, of R.A. Fisher's association with eugenics. Fully one-third of Fisher's greatest work, the five concluding chapters in genetical theory, are devoted to an analysis of the decay of civilizations and its prevention by raising the fertility of more prosperous or superior <coughs> social groups. Well, that's great, isn't it? I mean, we, we think of uh, eugenics as being associated with uh, forced sterilization of people with reduced IQs and so on. Uh, and so we, we think of R.A. Fisher as a, a good guy in the world of eugenics because he just said if you're rich and intelligent and get along well with others, you should have more babies. <coughs> but they're really the same thing. It's an argument that some people are better than others and putting pseudoscience behind it. Now, this pseudoscience happens to have given rise to a lot of legitimate stati statistical theory, um, but it doesn't really mask the fact that, fact that uh, eugenics was very key to the career of R.A. Fisher. This was something he spent a lot of his life trying to, to drive forward. In fact, he was a, uh, at the University College of London, uh, he was the first uh, professor to head the Department of Eugenics, 
1933, and it stayed, uh, the na it, it retained the name of the Department of Eugenics until 1939. Now, what would have happened in 1939 that maybe caused people to think eugenics wasn't so hot? World War II. World War II, World War II uh, was really starting to, to kick into full gear about that time. I mean, even people in the United States knew a war was going on by then, so that was uh, a, a pretty big sea change. And we see that eugenics was a lot of what, um, a, a lot of the pseudoscience that Hitler used to justify the things he did to gay people, to Jews, to to uh, gypsies, to anybody he didn't like, frankly. He, he could argue that each of these was, some, was a group of untermenschen, people who were below others. Uh, so we see, we see uh, R.A. Fisher getting involved in eugenics at a time when it had really uh, gained capture, uh, had captured public imagination. So this is, this is something that we, we can't like very much. In fact, I would note that his association with it didn't start with becoming chair of that department in 1933. The photo that I took from the prior page came from very early in his career, 1912, uh, when he was a steward at the first International Eugenics Conference. So his career is pretty inextricable from, from eugenics, and it's very worth remembering that. This is not to say that the numerical methods he created are junk. They're not. It's just that he put them in service to something that caused great scars in humanity. All right. That said, he had a lot to contribute, and he contributed very fruitfully through his career. I would point out that his very first publication in 1912, the picture that I showed you a couple, uh, a couple slides ago came from that, was about maximum likelihood, establishing for the first time how we can use this method for some complex, uh, complex modeling. So maximum likelihood was his first creation. He was the first person to observe that the mean of samples drawn from a population is not the same thing as the mean of the population at large. So that's a pretty big contribution. He was the first person to define variance as a, as a statistical term. He was one of the most essential people in linking the, the theories of, of Gregor Mendel and, and his Punnett squares and so on, his, his work with basic genetics, and tying that to Darwin, right? That is a pretty important uh, step towards our, our understanding what we now call the modern synthesis. At the time, that was uh, uh, the Neo-Darwinism uh, Neo synthesis uh, that was published. So he was one of the key figures in, in showing how things like height, which is not a yes or no trait, can be linked to genes, which are discrete in their nature. Of course, he gave us ANOVA, which is why we're talking about it right now. And he wrote this very critical tome called Statistical Methods for Research Workers. People like us, after all. He was very interested in seeing that biomedical researchers, what we would now call biomedical researchers, were equipped with statistical and mathematical tools to solve the problems we face every day. I love the quote at the left. It is, I think, one of the best quotes in the field of statistics. I want to read it. To consult the statistician after an experiment is finished is often merely to ask him to conduct a post-mortem examination. He can, he or she, can perhaps say what the experiment died of. Right? When do we go to the statistician? Typically, it's once we have data to show. But if you talk to the statistician beforehand, you're in a much better position to know whether your experiment can prove anything at all. These are the folks that we run to, after all, when we need a power analysis for our grant applications. But coming to the statistician only at the very 11th hour, when you've done all the experiment and you just want to know is it, is it different or not? Is a real mistake. In, involving statistics as early as possible is the right way to go. Okay. So, the other person I want to introduce to you is John W. Tukey. Has anyone heard his name? Tukey? We think of Tukey as, uh, in, in some ways, as a founder of computer science, actually. Uh, but his career started, you know, in earnest around World War II, let's say. So he was born back in 1915. This is a, a lot later than, uh, uh, than, than R.A. Fisher was, right? You saw the picture of him from 1912. This guy was born three years after that. So uh, he's, he's definitely a generation later in that way. He was a prodigious original researcher in statistics. He, he considered himself a statistician, but he had an amazing impact on telecommunications and on computer science. We're going to talk about a couple of those things. He started his PhD in Princeton, uh, and two years later, 
had completed a mathematics PhD. That is not a normal progression for most people. He achieved the rank of full professor by age 35. So when, when do people become a full professor? When they're old? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was very lucky. Uh, I, I was able to, in coming to South Africa, I became a professor, but I was, what, 42, something like that. So, uh, and, and that, that by itself is already, did you say, am I that old? <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> I was born in 1973. <laughs> Thank you. For yes. some reason, I told you did it by. Oh, thank you so much. He gets bonus points just for that. No, I, I am turning 44 in November, so, um, yeah. I'm an oldster. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, so, <coughs> getting full professor is a tough thing. I mean, most people come in as like an assistant professor, and you kind of dodder around in the wilderness for a while, and maybe you make tenure, right? And if you make tenure, you might become an associate professor, then you dawdle around in the wilderness again for another seven, eight years, and then your department says, you know what, you're actually kind of important. I think we should call you a full professor. So generally you have this very slow progression through the career ranks, and becoming a full professor really takes some, some special things. So to do so by age 35 is kind of ridiculous. There are a lot of blogs out there that have been written about uh, the, the biography of this guy. There's a very good one, for example, from Bell Labs. But I, I stole this photo of, of Tukey from this unbiased research blogs, uh, blogspot uh, site, so I thought I would give the URL for that. Now, he's what we call a polymath. Have you heard the term polymath? It doesn't mean he likes lots of mathematics. It means he likes lots of things. So he calls himself a statistician. But keep in mind that in 1958, he coined the term software and bit for the first time. That sounds like a computer scientist to me. Um, one of his favorite quotes was, the best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everyone's backyard. If you know how to make sense of data, whether you're working with gene expression in plants or moving containers through a, a rail stockyard, the methods you know are applicable to all of these things. So this is one of these things where numeracy gives you the ability to broaden your career tremendously. He liked this idea that our, the, the methods we use are applicable across these different spectra. Along the way, he had quite a few things that he contributed in his own right. Now, we just talked about R.A. Fisher and all the amazing things he did. But having confidence intervals that we could build around ANOVA analyses, uh, the, the analysis of variance, was produced by uh, John Tukey. The fast Fourier transform, has anyone heard of this? FFTs? FFT is a ridiculously common method. Uh, has anyone ever listened to an MP3? <laughs> a few people have played an MP3. Very good. All right, so you have benefited from fast Fourier transform. Because what we've learned is that if you try to compress music as, a, as, ampli as a, an amplitude versus time signal, it's very hard to compress well. But if you do it in the frequency domain, you can compress it really well. And that's, that, that's what FFT allows us to do, to change something from a, an amplitude versus time signal into a frequency signal. We also use it in things like uh, mass spectrometry, for example. When we do a Fourier transform mass spectrometry experiment, we are, we are using this FFT uh, methodology to be able to translate between frequency and, and mass domains and things. It's very amazing. So FFT is hugely valuable. Um, I think at some point, most of us have used a box and whisker plot uh, where you, uh, we'll, we'll look at one later on in the course, but the, these give us the ability to visualize the distribution of data in a very compact way. Generally, he was one of the founders of this field of exploratory data analysis, suggesting that looking at your data and evaluating uh, uh, different uh, appraisals of it would give you a lot more insight into how to make sense, how to build information from your data and robust statistical methods, being able to resist outliers, having fewer expectations about uh, its distribution and so on, that these are all valuable. So you can get uh, all this information and much more from this biography of, of, of Tukey uh, at the, I think, the American Society of Statistics. All right, so let us come to ANOVA itself. We're going to discuss one way ANOVA right now. Later on in the course, either before or after I go to Russia, we're going to try to 
discuss a, a, a two-factor analysis as well. But for now, we're going to focus on just the simplest way you might use ANOVA. You will frequently see people uh, in their presentations giving a plot of things from of type A and things from type B and things from type C and then things from type D. And you might see a little line drawn between, let's say, C and D with a little star on it. Has anyone seen a plot like that? Okay. Generally, what they're trying to say is that when I, have a, when I draw this little line with a star between things of type C and things of type D, I'm making a claim that they're distributed differently or that they have different means. Okay? Now, the, the bad way to do this, I have frequently seen, and so I just want to warn you against it. If you have things of A, B, C, and D, and you're trying to decide whether they're different, if, you, if all you know is t-test, one of the things you might mistakenly do is compare A to B, A to C, A to D, B to C, B to D, and C to D. Has anyone ever done this? People have done this. This is not the way to go. And so today, I'm trying to teach you the method of how to compare multiple classes of things, more than two classes of things, all at the same time. Okay? That's what one way ANOVA is really, really good for. So, you have an independent variable, let's say height or weight or something, that come from more than two groups in the population. Does the independent variable reflect group identity? Is group identity something that causes the mean value for that measured variable to change? So, maybe you have a bunch of apples, pears, bananas, and oranges, and you want to know, does the weight differ among these four types of things? ANOVA is very good at questions like that. All right. So, <clears throat> we talked before about the T statistic. Everyone remember the T statistic as part of the T test? You ran a T test. From that, you got a T statistic, and you knew the number of degrees of freedom associated with it. Together, you were able to use that information to look up this value on a T distribution and say, how, much, how likely is it? that by random chance we would get a value more extreme than this if there's no difference. Okay, that was the T statistic. The F statistic is the corresponding statistical metric that we use in ANOVA. It, however, is a, compari a comparison of two different variances. You can think of this as the explanatory value of some label that you have on your data. Let's say, for example, that we have a table of uh, gender, uh, and height for everyone in the, in the department. And we want to, and we want to ask, uh, is gender a factor in affecting height? Now that's just a two-category thing. We could do that with a t-test. But imagine if you have something like uh, uh, birth sign, right? So I was born in November. I'm a Scorpio. So you could say, does birth sign have something to do with height? How about you, sir? What, what, what sign are you? A Libra, okay. So we've got Libras, we've got Scorpios, probably have some Virgos, some Cancers, blah, 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 blah. You can subdivide the population of this department into 12 different signs and ask, does your birth sign affect your height? Okay, this is a nonsense example, quite obviously. <laughs> but from that, we can ask, how much explanatory power does birth sign have in determining a person's height? Now, I would say it has zero predictive power, but... So, in effect, that is an explanation for why we see differences. So you can think of that as explained variance, and you can compare that to all the variance that we see. Another way to think about this is between group variability. How much, ver how much variability do we have between, say, Cancers and Scorpios, or Cancers and Pisces? How much variability do we have between groups? And make that a ratio with the variability that we have within the individual groups, just within the Pisces, just within the Cancers. Okay? So, if you have just two groups, the F statistic is the same thing as the T squared statistic. So that's an odd exception. But one of the things I want to drive home here is that if you have two groups, ANOVA will give you the same result as the T-test, assuming that everything is handled exactly the same way. So, 
this is another test statistic that we're talking about, and it's different than the t-statistic. But we're still going to use this distribution that comes from it, the f, the f distribution, not the t distribution, to determine our p-values. Now, there are some very pretty uh, graphs in this online course from uh, Pennsylvania State, so you might want to look at that if you want to think about this a little more. <clears throat> when we do this ratio of two variances, we compute an f statistic. So for a particular f statistic, let's say a value of 2, we can ask, what is the probability that we have a more extreme value by random chance alone? And that's the integral out to infinity above our value. So before, we had to handle things like two-tailed tests, where uh, maybe it's greater than 2 and maybe uh, plus the possibility that it's lower than negative 2. Remember when we looked at the two tails of, of the t-statistic? Here, it, it becomes one-sided. So when we have a, our, our f-statistic, we ask for values that are higher than it, and it's essentially always uh, two-tailed. Now, I've drawn in four different curves here. All of these are distribution curves for the f-statistic. But we note that the, the curve that we see for two degrees of freedom, this case where we just have two examples, uh, we have a, a very different kind of curve than we do for four degrees of freedom, eight degrees of freedom, and 16 degrees of freedom. There are two degrees of freedom, in fact, or two different degrees of freedom that we have to define in making our f-statistic curve. One of them has to do with how many groups there are within the population, like in our, in our zodiac example, we have 12 groups there, so 11 degrees of freedom. The second one has to do with how many degrees of freedom we have within some group. So if we have 38 cancers, that's going to figure into the second degree of freedom. So I just set it to 40 in each case here. Okay. So what value does, is 2p, honestly significant di uh, difference, going to do for us? The first thing is that one-way ANOVA will tell you that a difference exists, but it won't tell you where. So if we did our ANOVA of all the heights in the department as a function of birth sign, we would, uh, we would first, we would first uh, learn from that one-factor ANOVA, is there any significant association between birth sign and height? And we'd probably get no significance whatsoever on that score. But in a lot of cases, we will find differences, and ANOVA will flag that for us. But if you have five different groups in play, maybe A's, B's, C's, D's, and E's, you would need ten different t-tests in order to find all those differences. So you might compare A's to B's, A's to C's, A's to D's, A's to E's, and so on. And I say that there are ten of those because any time you have n items, the number of handshakes between them is equal to n times n minus one divided by two. So 5 times 4 is 20. 20, good. Divided by 2 is 10. Great. That's how I get my number 10 different t-tests. So if you did this, you, you would really be much more likely to find a significant difference than you should. I'm going to try to explain why. Imagine having done one t-test... What is the random chance, the chance if there's no real difference, that you find a significant difference? Where do we define significance in our p-values, typically? Zero point zero five. Excellent, good, okay. Yes, so since time immemorial, we have been telling students that if you have a p-value less than 0 0.05, that's significant. This is largely from something Fisher said way back when that is probably being misapplied. And in fact, there's a really big pushback now in big journals to say 0.05 is nowhere near selective enough, that we need to be much more stringent about what p-values we say are real associations. So 0.05 is already out of date, in other words. Um, <clears throat> we want very, very low p-values to say there's no way that we would see a, a test statistic like this if there's no difference. Okay, so if we use the old school definition, we would say that any individual t-test has by random chance a 1 in 20 shot of producing a, a false significance. No real difference. The t-test says there is, though. This is an example of a false significance call. If you have 10 t-tests, 
the chance that one of them, by random chance, is giving you a false positive is much higher. After all, if you run 20 t-tests, you expect that by random chance, one of them will give you significance falsely. Maybe that doesn't make sense, but let me, let me try it again. Any time you run a t-test, you have a 1 in 20 chance of producing a significant difference, even if there isn't one. So that means that if you run 20 t-tests, you expect that one of them will give you, will, will, will reject the null hypothesis wrongly. All right? This is going to come into play really heavily when we talk about multiple testing. But for now, I just want you to internalize that. Running lots and lots of t-tests greatly increases your chance of wrongly rejecting the null hypothesis. Okay, so Tukey honestly significant difference test is designed to protect you from that. ANOVA just told us one of these pairings, at least, is not uh, the same. Tukey is going to find that difference for us. Now, I have, I have given about the simplest R example possible uh, to explain how to do ANOVA with a follow-up Tukey. Uh, one of the valuable things that R offers us is a whole bunch of libraries of data sets that have been studied for a long time by statisticians. So the plant growth model is one of them. So first off, we just set a variable equal to that, and that gives us these data to work with. From there, we need to fit a linear model. In this case, I'm using analysis of variance function, which is basically just another call to the linear model function that we talked about last week, to, to run an, a linear model fit on the data here. So remember that we have to put an equation in when we're doing these linear, linear model fits. In this case, we've said weight is a function of group. These data sets have three different categories in them, control, treatment one, and treatment two. So it's saying, I believe that the weight we observe for a plant is a function of whether it's from the control group, the treatment one group, or the treatment two group. And the data will come from this plant growth object that we created. We're going to run this example in a second. Then, having created this analysis of variance uh, linear fit, we run ANOVA on it. And ANOVA just pops out, an pops out information right there that includes the p-value associated with it. Then, we can run the two-key honestly significant difference test on this model that we created to tell us where the difference is. Now, what if ANOVA tells us that there's no significant difference to be found. What if ANOVA reported a p-value of 0.15, for example? What should we do? We stop right there. You just stop right there. If ANOVA tells you none of these, none of these categories are different from each other, don't proceed to the Tukey Honestly Significant Difference Test. You've already been informed that the means don't differ. So looking for the difference is wrong. <laughs> now maybe you really hoped that there was a significant difference to be found among your data. Maybe treatment one and treatment two should certainly have looked different from control and you're really peeved and you're sure the difference is there but ANOVA didn't find it. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. When we do an experiment, we like to see significant differences but don't torture the data until you compel it to give you a significant p-value. PIs have to learn this lesson too. PIs don't run experiments without wanting them to show a significant difference of some sort. You may be told by your PI, you must be running ANOVA wrong. Go ahead and find the difference. <laughs> it takes a lot of strength, frankly, to know your statistics well enough to know that when ANOVA says there's no significant difference, you don't then proceed to look for a difference. Okay, so this is an example of the kind of workflow that we're going to work our way through. So, running a pile of t-tests <coughs> is almost never the right answer, right? If you have to do something like that, you must do something called multiple test correction that we're going to talk about on another week. <coughs> so, just because you know how to do a t-test does not mean it's the right test to run. In its simplest form, ANOVA helps us to ask whether any differences are present in our data sets across multiple categories. 
Tukey HSD acts as a follow-on should ANOVA reveal that a difference is present. Okay? Now, I'm going to, uh, to do a, a quick demo of, of some of these things. I have included our code in uh, the usual location on the Google Drive. Hopefully you found it. I, I uploaded those about an hour before this session. So uh, let us now uh, look at our, our code. Our code. Okay, so uh, here I've started R on the side. Maybe you're using R Studio instead of R. That's absolutely fine. Now I'm going to start with some of the plots that I used in this class. So we started with a plot of what the F distributions look like. You can see that I've specified uh, that the, the, the degrees of freedom for the first curve is, is set to 2, to 4, to 8, to 16 for these additional ones. I can just copy this over to R, paste it in, that all runs just fine. Now I'm going to create a, a plot of this using a couple different factors that I wanted to, to note. Let's just start by making the base plot. Okay, I'll that vertically. So I've done some, some squirrely things here. In this plot function, do you see, did you see the type command that I included? Uh, if I return to the code that launched this, uh, you may be able to see it here. So up here, create an initially blank plot. I told it to plot x versus t2 as the, the, the first curve to be shown, the red line. Uh, I, t I told it to label the y-axis probability, but then I did something weird. I said the type equals none. All right, this is kind of a trick that a lot of our code will end up using to create a blank plot that we subsequently add information to. If you set this to type equals L, it will make a line plot. If you leave that out, it will create circles for the data points that, you, that, that you're plotting. Here, because I've set the type to none, no symbols are put in place from the data that I've, I've chosen from T2. And so I have to add T2 in the very next line by adding that, that line command on top of that. Everyone gets that trick? Okay, so create an initially blank canvas, then draw lines on it subsequently. The other thing that I'm going to do is add a legend. A lot of people need to add a legend on their plots, right? But it's sometimes a little strange to do it. And R is a little per persnickety in how you do that. So here we see that I've added a legend. Now I've got those first two numbers, 2 comma 0 0.6. What sense does that have, right? In this case, I am telling R where on the plot that it creates should it place the box, right? So the legend that I'm going to create will be located on the x-axis at position 2 and on the y-axis at position 0.6. I just pick those manually. So you have a lot of power then in just defining where this legend is. You know, on Excel, maybe you would drag the box around on the plot until you sat it in a place you liked. Here you have to give the coordinates. So just wanted to advise you on that stuff. Now, we have another little bit of, of stuff here. I'm feeding it a whole bunch of text. See that? So I'm creating a vector that contains df equals 2 comma 40, df equals 4 comma 40, df equals 8 comma 40, and df equals 16 comma 40. So those are four bits of text. Those are the four lines that I'm placing on top of this. And then I give it a vector of colors, red, green, blue, purple. You can see those right above. That's the order of the lines that I added on top of this, red, green, blue, purple. So, and the last thing I wrote is LWD equals 3. Why did I add that? Line width. Line width, because my eyes, right? So, here we see that once I add this last line, my graph changes. Oops, sorry, in the wrong way. Okay. There we go. So we see that I'm a legend in my own time. I've Never mind, I'm just joking. <laughs> I've added a legend to our plot, and we see that it's anchored at 2 comma 0.6. So if I felt that was a little too low, maybe it's overlapping some of my data, I might boost that y value a little bit and shove it upwards. Okay, so we these are two tricks then that we can use when we're making our own plots. Create a, a plot of type none and add all the data subsequently, and we can add our own custom legends as well. It was available to me to instead use these as dotted lines or to put in um, 
you know, little colored stars for each one or something like that. I chose to just use line segments because it's one of the simpler ways to do a legend. Okay, so that's uh, one of the features that I wanted you to know how to do. Uh, and I borrowed a, a really useful example from a, an R bloggers website on the one-way analysis of variance. So they have a, a really good example. They were the ones who pointed out that plant growth is a good data set. So let us, uh, I, I've just opened R here, all I've done is, is make that plot. I want to just look at what is plant growth. So I just type plant growth. Okay. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this, uh, that off screen so we don't have to look at it. Let me rerun that. So plant growth clearly has 30 rows. We see that there are number values and there are treatment labels. I'm going to run a summary of it because I think that might be better. Plant growth. Okay. So one of the things that's popping out of the summary is how, these, how, this, how this data set is actually structured. We see that we have a numeric vector of weights with a minimum value of 3.59, a maximum value of 6.3, we've got means, medians, etc. And we have group labels. What we have are 10 controls, 10 treatments of, uh, sorry, 10 treatments of type 1, and 10 treatments of type 2. So those are the data that we have available within this data structure. That's nearly ideal for running an analysis of variance. It's a nice, tidy data set for that purpose. So uh, if we are to use these data, uh, in this case, I'm going to point a, a new variable at it called PG. So PG becomes our proxy for this. If I run summary of <coughs> PG, I get exactly the same result. That's all grand. Now, I'm going to show you um, that you are not restricted to base graphics when you do visualizations. Most of the talks that you see people doing using R are using really fancy schmancy graphics, not just the base graphics that are built in. There's a lot of powerful stuff you can do with base graphics. I mean, you've seen all these crazy plots I've been producing. But generally, when you see people doing really high-end stuff with, with graphics in R, they're doing it using a different library. Now, the one that I'm going to use here is called ggplot2. I'm not really qualified to tell you all of the ins and outs of ggplot2, but I know that in lots of cases, there are ways that you can do something in the base graphics mode that looks OK. But if you do it using the, the default functions in the grammar of graphics library, the gg2, the ggplot library2, you see amazing uh, differences. So we're going to use this. If you are using R on your own computer, you must install ggplot2 to be able to use it. So when I type, when I include this command, require ggplot2, if I tried to run that on your laptops and you hadn't installed it, you're going to get an error message. It'll, it'll say it's not there. So you have to install that. It's uh, available within R to, to run this. Uh, under install packages, it's one of the, the menu options. OK. So you don't have to run these next two lines in order to follow along, but I just want to show you that once I use these, I'm able to get a really beautiful little plot of these data. You see, it, it loaded the package, ggplot2, when I told it to. <clears throat> and now I get these data out. So this, this plotting command, I, I, should, I should say that it's called ggplot2 because it, it, it creates something called a grammar of graphics. It means that we can uh, we can create our, we can build our, our images out of these uh, different layers that we add to the, to the image. So in this case, we were creating a, a, bo a, box and whisper, a box and whisker plot of all 30 points that we had. Remember, we had 10 values within control, 10 values within treatment, and 10 values within treatment 2. So the plot that has resulted from this, created in Grammar of Graphics 2, gives us that, that information. Uh, one of the typical ways that these box plots work, that the, these uh, uh, box and whisker plots work, is, is typically that we have kind of a, uh, a non-parametric way to visualize the distributions. The typical way is that you show the middle bar of the box at the median. I think everyone remembers median from a few weeks back. We have the interquartile that's represented by the box, so those are the 25th and 75th percentiles. And then these whiskers extend out to show us maybe the whole range in some cases, or 
to show a truncated range where you have a couple points that are way out as outliers. So those two points within treatment one are very dramatic outliers at high values. And it didn't, the, the software felt that those felt, fell so far away from the rest of the distribution that they should be shown as separate points. Okay, so how did we call all of that? I'm going to return now to the console and we'll look at what happened. All right. So we're using an AES, which is I think a, a kind of an object fit from this, where we're specifying that the data should be split on the basis of group, which you remember was one of those two fields that we had in the data structure. We want the Y values to be those, those numeric weights. And you see all this business with plus, 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 plus. Those are different layers that are being added to the base plot. We have a box plot as the, the way we're going to visualize it. We have scale X is set to discrete, meaning that we have three different values that, that we have for the factor of group. We have specified what the X, lab, uh, the X label, X axis label should be, and we've specified what the Y axis label should be. So this is kind of a, a simple call to ggplot for creating these kinds of box plots. All right, so just be aware that ggplot uh, exists. Next, we're going to run our analysis of variance on PG model. Okay, so I create a new variable called PG model that's going to accept our analysis of variance. It's saying the, uh, that the weights in this data set are a function of group. So we expect, uh, the, the, the hypothesis that we're testing here is, is the, the null hypothesis that the, uh, the, the weights we see for the control are the same as the weights we see for treatment one, and they are the, the, mean, the mean is the same as it is for the treatment group two as well. That's the hypothesis. Now, uh, from there, I'm going to proceed to run an ANOVA that will evaluate what is effectively a linear model that's been fit on this basis. And you see right away I get information back. So I have two degrees of freedom in group. You often find this n minus one thing going on. We had three classes, control treatment one, treatment two, treatment two. That means there are two degrees of freedom from the three values that we've put in. On residuals, we had 27 degrees of freedom, which is a little harder to get to, but we had three groups of 10 each. So in, in effect, the software is saying there are nine degrees of freedom within each of the three categories. Adding those up, you get 27. But right out here, we have our F value, which represents the ratio of these two variances. And the software says, well, that's not random. It says that only 1.591% of the time would we expect to find an F statistic as extreme as this if there were no real difference. So we're getting a little star here. You see those are, these are the little significance codes that we're working with. It's saying that at the, uh, that this value that we get, the, the p-value that we get out, is significant at the 0.05 level. It's not significant at the 0.01 level um, which, because it's, it's higher than 1% rather than lower than, two, lower than 1%. So there's a difference here. Where is it, though? For that, we want the Tukey Honestly Significant Difference Test. So I come back over here, I type in 2 hsd and I paste it in. <clears throat> Tukey knows you have multiple groups, more than two, and it's going to try to find that difference for us. So we can see that it's going through all the combinations here. Treatment one versus control, treatment two versus control, and treatment two versus treatment one. If you have only certain subsets that you want to compare, you can specify only do the treatment one versus control and only do treatment two versus control. Here we're just using the basic call and having it compare any pairs within that. So in looking through those, we see that it's giving us a p-value, but it looks a little weird, doesn't it? This is an adjusted p-value. So Tukey knows you're doing multiple comparisons here, and it's not going to give you a p-value you can harm yourself with. Instead, it's adjusting those p-values to reflect the fact that we checked for three different pairwise comparisons. So, when we see these p-values, we say to ourselves, aha, treatment two was different than treatment one. 
But treatment two is not different than the control, and treatment one is not different than the control. So this is one of those places where these, where these values that come from when we're showing group A versus B versus C versus D versus E. You can generate those through a two-key, honestly significant difference test. Now, this is an example from empirical data, and that's great. But I think we all learn more about the statistics when we're able to, to simulate the data that we feed to it. Now, I wanted to give you a, a little bit more complex example. I realize that as the weeks pass, we're moving from like two and three line examples of, pro of, of how to do things to longer and longer ones. And this next example is a little longer, so I've only included that one. We'll walk through it, and then we'll be all done for the day. So I wanted to simulate data that I'm feeding to this. So I'm going to take all that stuff off screen and keep on going down here. Now I have my simulation that's going to be built around five groups, A, B, C, D, and E. And I wanted to have 20 data points within each of those groups. Okay? So how many data points in total will I have? I heard it. I have five groups, each of 20, so I have 100 data points. So I'm setting n to 20. n is just a variable at this point. I, I know that n means to me how many replicates per group. Okay? What are the height values for each item? So I'm creating a vector of height values, and I want it to represent these five different populations. Now, I'm doing a lot of things at once. So I, am, I have a, a create a vector thing going on here. That's what my C at the start means. But now I'm specifying five different populations separately. So my first 20 values, you see our norm is called on N which means it's going to generate the number of replicates from a, a normal distribution with a mean of four. All, all good with that so far, I think. It's going to add to that another group of n values, this time with a mean of five. Everyone following? Okay, so I've specified that group B has a mean of five where group A only has a, a mean of four. I add another group, this one's C of group four, I add a, a fifth group, uh, sorry, this is the fourth group, uh, with a mean of three, and finally, a group with a mean of four. So the, the, the first, third, and fifth all have a mean of four. The second one is high, with a group, of, uh, a group mean of five. The fourth group is low, with a mean, group, uh, a mean value of three. But I have to have labels to put on that as well. I want to note, by the way, I'm, I'm making this as easy as I can for ANOVA. I'm not adding any crazy outliers or anything. These are normally distributed errors. That's a rather important factor. ANOVA is going to expect that you're, it's going to expect that you're giving it normally distributed errors. So I have to give it some labels now. The, the original vector I create of heights is just 100 numbers, after all. We next need to apply labels to that. I'm adding a new function here. You see this rep function? the rep function is repeats. So I'm specifying that there are going to be 20 A values followed by 20 B values, 20 C values, 20 D values, 20 E values. These are simulated data then. Every time I run this, I'm gonna get a different result because those height values are sampled from a normal distribution. Okay, so I, I create those two vectors and then I'm going to stick them together in a, in a data structure you find everywhere, the data frame. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and run the simulation to this point. There's my n, there's my heights, those are my groups, this is the data frame. Okay, so I run that and it doesn't tell me anything. That's because it's just doing what I told it to. I can ask it what is the value of n, it says it's 20. I can ask it what is the value of height, we get back these hundred values. And I also get back the value of group, and I see it's A's, B's, C's, D's, E's, and that's it. I want to note that it also noticed that group is a factor. When I created it, I created it with the factor uh, parameter, uh, factor function, which says, notice how many different values of this there are. So it recognized that all levels, A, B, C, D, and E, are represented here that even though it's 100 values, they fall into those five categories. Everyone doing okay so far? All right, now, I created 
a data frame called hg from this, so I want to look at hg. Well, I only see the last few values because it spat it all out to screen when it was very big. So let's run summary instead. Here I see that my height values run from 1.012 up to 7.8, and those are the groups. But I'd like to visualize those. So I'm again going to use this ggplot2 code to do so. My, uh, my call to it is really no different than it was before. And having run that, oops, let me just switch over to the other window. <clears throat> I see what resulted from my random calls. So remember, groups A, C, and E should all have means of about four. Do they all have means of about four? I hear a yes. Well, d does, the, does the A group look like it's centered on four? It's a little low. This is the nature of random variation. I asked it to give me data that were centered on four, but with a standard deviation of one. And it did so. And when we look at the data that came out, the data for A turned out to be a little low this time. If I rerun this code, it's going to look different. The mean in both A and C is a little bit below 4. The mean for E, on the other hand, is a little bit above 4. And that's just random walking around. Now, B has a different mean, right? We gave it a mean of 5 rather than 4. And we see that the mean turned out to be even a little bit higher than 5. D was set to have a mean of 3, which should be about on that white line there. And instead, it's a little bit higher. So in just looking at the simulated data that come out, we see that in this case, D is going to be a little harder to distinguish from A, C, and E than we would expect B to be. B stands out more, even though really the distributions they were pulled from are equally distant from the, the center point. Okay, so having created this simulated data set, we can fit our model, run ANOVA, and run Tuki. So I'm going to run an analysis of variance on those data. I'm going to back up a little bit here. I just ran all of it at once, but you can run them separately, of course. All right, when we ran the analysis of variance up here, we see that the p-value we generated from the data was way significant, right? I mean, a value of 10, times, uh, 10, time, uh, 10 raised to the negative seventh power is a very, very small number. It gave us three stars, which indicates that our uh, significance code uh, indicates less than 0.1% chance of this happening randomly, if there were no differences among them. So ANOVA says, everybody out of the pool, there is a big difference among groups here. When we run Tukey, it has a lot of work to do. I gave it five different classes, which means there are ten different intergroup tests it must run. So Tukey comes back with the information in a very um, orderly way. It's going to do A to B, A to C, A to D, A to E, and so on, in, a, in this rigorous order. So it covers all of the combinations. We can see the actual differences. We get the lower and upper bounds on what those differences were. And at the end of the day, we again get an adjusted p-value. The adjusted p-values are best for D versus B. D versus B. Now, when I set this up, I was talking about the differences versus A, C, and E, because those were the ones that were all set to the same median, uh, the same um, uh, average value. But D versus B looks even more different because B was way up high and D was way down low. So the highest p-value that we get back relates to that, to that difference in polarity. Now, which of these are actually different and which of these are not? Let's start with the, which ones are not. A, C, and E are all distributed exactly the same. So let's look at those. We have A versus C. Its p-value is very nearly 1. <laughs> That's not significant. A versus E is, again, almost 1. No significant difference. Uh, we have one more to do, that would be E versus C. Again, almost no difference. So we're feeling pretty good about this. When we sampled from uh, the same mean, 
it, it is unable to find any difference um, between those two uh, sets. Now, any comparison involving B should find a difference because A versus B, B versus C, B versus D, all of those should be different because B is the only one that had a mean of five. We see that it's significant versus A, it's significant versus C, it is definitely significant against uh, D, and it's significant against E. So this is nice. When we had 20 replicates, they were normally distributed, blah, blah, blah. We're able to find that difference uniformly. Now, D was a bit more problematic, wasn't it? Do I remember correctly? That D was a little closer to A, C, and E. So maybe we won't have as much uh, luck there. But let's try A versus D. Are A and D different? They're not. Okay. Keep this in mind. When you run an experiment, there may be a biological difference. There may be a real difference, as there is between uh, uh, D and, and, and others at this point. But it may be that the data simply don't support your claim that they're different. Maybe if we did 100 replicates rather than 20, or it simply reran the experiment, we may find that they're different. So there's no requirement that because there's a biological difference, your data will say that they are different. That's a hard lesson, but it's something we all have to keep in mind. All right, so D versus A, no difference. D versus B, definite difference. That's a mean of five versus a mean of three. D versus C, no significant difference. We know that there should be, but there isn't one observed. And D versus E, no dice. Okay, so sometimes the difference is not found to be significant difference, is significantly different, even if there's really a difference between the two. Maybe if we up this to twice the, twice the N, we would see that change. Now, just uh, for giggles, I'm going to rerun this code, and we'll see if those results change for us. All right, clearing away a bunch of stuff. Now, let's rerun our height and weight computations, replot it, and so on. Okay. I'm going to flip over to our plot for just a moment. This is the replot. This is after we redid it. Now, our, our group B is now spot on, on uh, a mean of five. Our, group, uh, our, our uh, mean for group D is actually below three. But look at this oddity that happened on, on, row, uh, on uh, set E. It's got a really wide distribution, and it actually overlaps with the mean of D. Data from experiments have some amount of observational and biological variation in them. It may be that your measurement is... is uh, is a, is a typical analytical methodology and it has some error in the values that it produces. And maybe the biology that you're working with is a little bit variable. So this is a case where the computer is producing all the variation. If we run the code, we'll, we'll see uh, that it, it does or does not find statistical significance and we'll look at the pairwise uh, combinations. So I hope that in the, in the course of today's lecture you learned at least a simple way that ANOVA can help you decide whether group means are different or not, and how you can use Tukey's honestly significant difference test to protect you in doing all of these pairwise comparisons among the different combinations. So with that, I think we're all done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.